Well, please turn to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 8, and we're going to read from verses 11 through to 21. I was going to tackle this evening, we were going to tackle the rest of the chapter, but as I read these verses, I wanted to just press pause for one evening and just look at these two short, two short incidences. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 11 to 13, the Pharisees demand a sign, and then verses 14 to 21, the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. And let's read these verses. You'll see them on page 843 if you're using the Black the Black Church Bible, 843, or large print, 1003. The Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from Him a sign from heaven to test Him. And He sighed deeply in His spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, the yeast of the Pharisees, the yeast of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Well, as you find your place in Mark's Gospel chapter 8 again, let me ask you this evening a question. Is it worse to be an unbeliever or to be an apostate? Or is there no difference? An unbeliever is somebody who has never darkened a church door in their life, or if they have, they've watched, they've listened, they've turned their back, they're not interested. They have never had anything to do with Jesus and His rule as king. That's an unbeliever. An apostate is someone who used to belong, used to believe, used to bow the knee to Jesus as king, and has turned their back on it and walked away from it. And we tend to think, don't we, that there's no real difference between those two. At the end of the day, both of them are rejecting Jesus. Both end up in the same place. Neither of them believe. Different starting place, same destination, same difference, right? In fact, friends, the Bible is clear in many different places and in many different types of teaching that it is worse to start out with God and to abandon Him than to have never had anything to do with Him at all. Some of you will remember the name Christopher Hitchens. He was quite a famous uh, atheist, very intelligent man, great speaker, and uh, in the last years of his life, was particularly exercised about the Christian faith and how wrong it was and how the world needed to know how false Christian faith is. And a few years before he died, an American pastor, a controversial American pastor called Douglas Wilson, took Christopher Hitchens on in a series of debates. They traveled throughout the United States, debating in different locations. And the texts of their debates are published in a book called, Is Christianity Good for the World? At the very end of that debate, here is how Douglas Wilson ends his appeal to Christopher Hitchens. He says this, I want you to see that you carry the standing obligations of repentance, belief, and continued discipleship. Your Christian name, Christopher, means bearer of Christ. That is what the word Christopher means, carrier of Christ. 
Christopher Hitchens, you were baptized as a child. Your baptism means the same thing. And the third commandment requires you not to bear that name in vain. Some people, as you have done, revolt against the terms of this discipleship, but it does not mean that the demands of discipleship have been revoked. Come back to Christ, Wilson said to him. Our passage tonight that we're going to look at, these short verses in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, these verses are a warning, friends. Sometimes morning and evening sermons, unplanned kind of dovetail, don't they? And if this morning was a warning, I'm afraid, again, here it is from the lips of the Lord Jesus this evening. A warning to those who are familiar with the gospel, who are familiar with Jesus, who are familiar with the church, who love Him and who want to be with Him. This is a warning about ending up no longer walking with Him. And in fact, this is a clever, beautiful description of how you get there, how you get to that place of having turned your back and walked away. Friends, in, in nearly 15 years of standing in this position behind a pulpit, I have seen the Bible warn countless people who have not heeded that warning, who have wandered away, who are no longer walking with the Lord Jesus. Looking out on you this evening, I can picture their faces, I can remember them. They are in a perilous place because they were God's people. The demands of discipleship placed on their lives in their baptisms have not been negated or revoked. And in 45 years of being part of God's people, I have been warned from the Bible, sitting where you are sitting, I have been warned from the Bible by countless preachers and teachers who have not heeded the warning and who have wandered away from Jesus. And it is worse to be like that, friends, than to be an unbeliever. I want to show you this evening, Jesus feels that it is worse. How do you not get there? Let me show you two things. Number one, don't fail to hear who you might be like. Don't fail to hear who you might be like. And number two, don't fail to see how you might be like them. Don't fail to see how you might be like these people. So here's the first one. Number one, don't fail to hear who you might be like. Don't fail to hear who it is in this passage you might be like. It's all about hearing and seeing, isn't it? Verse 18, Jesus says to his disciples, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? The disciples can't see and hear, can they? Even though they're looking and they're listening, their eyes are open, their ears are open, they're looking at the Lord Jesus and listening to his words, but they cannot see and they can't hear. And what they can't hear is who Jesus says they might end up being like. Okay, look how it works, verse 14. They had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Okay, three verses with something in the middle, bread on either side. See how it works? One of them says, look, we've only got one loaf of bread. Somebody says, Matthew, did you, did you bring the bread? Did you bring the sandwiches? And Matthew says, no, I, I thought Judas was picking them up. Oh, we've forgotten again. No bread. What are we going to do? And Jesus sees this and hears this, and he says to them, as they say, we've only got one loaf, he says to them, listen, beware of the kind of bread that the Pharisees will give you to eat. Watch out for what Herod does with bread. Both the Pharisees and Herod spread something through the food that they give you. And the disciples hear it, and carry on chatting about the fact that they have no bread. Verse 16, what's happened? 
they have failed to hear who they might be like. Jesus is taking the absence of bread as an opportunity to warn them about the Pharisees, isn't he? To warn them about Herod, and they fail to hear it. All they hear is literal bread. See, the the disciples have just got into this boat, haven't they? After Jesus has left the Pharisees on the shore in verse 13. And he's left the Pharisees there in judgment. Jesus is exasperated with them, isn't he? Look at verse 12. They've come seeking a sign. Do you notice? Not a sign because they want to know him better and to love him better. It's a sign to test him. To test him. Just look back at chapter 3, verse 6. Who is it that is asking Jesus for a sign? Look back at Mark's gospel, chapter 3, verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus, how to destroy him. See, when you've already decided that you want to kill Jesus, but you come to him and ask him for a sign, what does it say about how you feel about him? The Pharisees have seen Jesus do miracle after miracle right in front of their eyes, and they do not care for him. And so Jesus looks at them, verse 12, and he says, do you know what? people like you have always existed. This generation, that, that word generation, it, it, it tends to refer in the Bible to, to a particular group of people. It's the generations who died in the wilderness because they tested Moses. Remember Moses? He led them. He fed them with bread from heaven. He, he gave them water from the rock to drink. And what did they do? They rebelled against him. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says they are a crooked and twisted generation. See what Jesus is saying? You you Pharisees, you Pharisees, you're, you're not Gentiles. You're not outsiders. You're Jews. You're God's own people, my people. You've grown up with the law that prophesied my coming. You have the Bible in your homes. You've seen me do miracle after miracle, and yet you still think I'm working for the devil. And for people like that, God's own people who become indifferent to who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, there is only judgment. Verse 13, he leaves them. Friends, verse 13 should chill the blood. He left them. He left them. He came to his own, and his own received him not. He left them got into the boat again and went to the other side. Friends, here is how the Bible works. Every single Sunday, mirror, mirror on the wall, who am I like most of all? Isn't that what Jesus is saying in the boat? Beware of the Pharisees that we have just left to his disciples. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who am I like most of all? Mirror, mirror in the sermon, who am I like most of all? I couldn't get a word to rhyme with sermon. Mirror, mirror, Sunday the 21st of November, Sunday the 28th of November, Sunday the 5th of December 2021, mirror, mirror from the pulpit, who am I like most of all? Don't be like the Pharisees, Jesus is saying. Don't grow up with God and have the Bible and love the Bible oh so much that you end up losing sight of Jesus himself. And all the time, every Sunday, Jesus is giving us pictures. We had a picture this morning, didn't we? The basket of ripe fruit. What does Jesus say? Don't be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Don't be like the rich man who built bigger and bigger barns. Don't be like this type of soil, hard soil, thorny ground. Don't be like this. Don't be like that. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. What what do you want out of church every week? Why do you come? What are you here for Sunday by Sunday? To, To get life to work? To have all your needs met, to be happy, healthy, wealthy. 
I'll tell you what you most need, says the Lord Jesus. I want you, my people, to not end up where the Pharisees have ended up. They have ended up, in fact, not my people. They are ending up like the generations who tested God in the wilderness and who fell and who died. And he says, don't be like Herod either. Now, let me try and explain Herod to us in the second point this evening. Point number one, don't fail to hear who you might be like. And number two, friends, don't fail to see how we might be like them. Don't fail to see how we might be like them, how this works. How do you end up looking like them? It's not just hearing, is it? It's seeing. And in verse 15, Jesus uses a picture to help us see how to not be like the Pharisees and Herod. And look, here's where I hope this all comes together for us. Here's where it gets practical. We all like pictures, don't we? Verse 15, he cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven, the yeast of Herod. Do you notice Jesus does not say, beware the Pharisees, beware Herod. No, he tells us what they're like. Yeast, leaven. See, leaven or yeast, if you have it in your house, you will know it is a tiny ingredient, isn't it? You, you put a tiny thing in something else, and that tiny amount spreads through the whole, the whole lot. In the Bible, yeast is a picture of evil, of corruption. Do you remember at the Exodus from Egypt, as God's people are leaving, leaving Egypt, the Israelites left so quickly that they couldn't add yeast to their bread. There wasn't time to work the yeast through the dough. And so their bread was unleavened. It didn't rise. It was flat bread. So what happens is no yeast in bread becomes a sign of God's saving activity, rescuing his people from Egypt, and bread with yeast in it, bread with leaven in it, becomes a sign of being left in Egypt, trapped in Egypt. It was a picture of still being under Pharaoh's rule. It's why every year at the Passover feast, the Israelites didn't just eat unleavened bread. They actually went through their house and cleared out all the yeast from the cupboards. They got rid of the yeast from the house. It was a symbol of what it means to be completely free of Egypt, to, to be free of Pharaoh's rule, free of his evil hold on their life. And so the idea of leaven and yeast, you see, becomes associated with evil. God's enemies. If you talk about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod, you are not saying something nice about them. But more than that, friends, do you notice you are painting a picture of how what it is that is not good about them actually does its not good work. See that? Yeast is a little, barely insignificant thing, and it goes a long, long way. Yeast slowly spreads. Leaven ends up transforming the whole. Remember Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, your boasting is not good. Do you know what they were boasting about? Their sexual immorality. Somebody in the church sleeping with his father's new wife. And they were boasting about it. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole dough, he says? See, Paul is saying, you're boasting in your sexual immorality. These Corinthians are saying, it's just a little thing, Paul. It's not, it's not, it's not the whole church is doing. It's just somebody off in the corner. But we're not all doing. It's not the official church position, of course. It's just one relationship. Paul is saying, no, that, that's not how false teaching and that's not how evil morality works. You just need a little bit to spoil the whole lot. We would say today, one rotten apple spoils the barrel. It will spread, and it will spread slowly, and it will spread imperceptibly, and it will ruin the lot. 
Brothers and sisters, when the Lord Jesus says to us and to his disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, he means beware of ending up where they are. Beware of being like them slowly over time. And the way that you end up being like them is little by little by little, by yeast spreading through your person until you end up like them. It's, it's how it works, isn't it? No, no Christian bookshop, not that I've ever seen anywhere, has a book entitled, Find Your Inner Pharisee, How to Be Like Herod. Trinity never runs a Pharisee's explored course. Herod made simple. No, no, nobody writes it out like that. Nobody makes it out like that. But Jesus says, but you can end up there. You, you can get what they have. You can be where they are. Do you see it? How? By taking the yeast of who they are, just a, just, just a little bit of them, and letting it sit there year by year, working its way into your heart until one day it is fully grown and you are fully baked, just like Herod, just like the Pharisees, once God's people, once with Him, now showing yourself to be an outsider, an insider who has become so hardened to Jesus that as an outsider, your position is now worse than being an, an unbeliever. You have moved from the inside to the outside. You have become a backslider, an apostate, someone to whom so much was given. You threw it back in his face. And Jesus is saying, you do not get there overnight, friends. You get there leavenly, ye yeastly. In other words, slowly. Friends, don't fail to see how you might end up like them. You won't be them tomorrow, okay? You will not be them tomorrow, but you might be them in five years' time or 10 years' time. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, Matthew's gospel tells us that when Jesus said these words, what he meant by leaven was the teaching of the Pharisees. Matthew literally says that to us. Beware the doctrine of the Pharisees. Beware their teaching. What was their teaching? Look back at chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, you Pharisees, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See, Pharisees add to the Bible, don't they? they? They tie up heavy burdens and they lay heavy weights on people's shoulders. Do this, don't do that. Don't touch this, don't touch that. And look at verse 14 of chapter 7. You remember what Struan showed us, Will showed us in these past weeks? What is the very heart of it? There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. You remember, the heart of it is they don't see that what is on the inside is what really matters to God. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Pharisees don't see that sin comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Pharisees avoid pornographic films because they don't need them. They have a pornographic mind. And that's okay because nobody, nobody can see that. It's what J.C. Ryle calls self-righteousness and formalism. That's the leaven of the Pharisee, self-righteousness and formalism. Outward religion only. What, what's the leaven of Herod? Remember Herod, the Jewish king, the Roman puppet, who had an affair with his brother's wife? Herod was the king who liked to hear the message about Jesus, but who refused to submit to Jesus, who refused to repent. Remember what we looked at in chapter 6, Herod would not believe because he refused to repent. He refused to repent. J.C. Ryle says, the leaven of Herod 
is worldliness and skepticism. Worldliness and skepticism. Yes, I'm interested in you, Jesus, but I need to keep my life the way I want it. I need to be king of my own life. I'm quite interested in following you, but I, I just will not give up that one particular sin, that one particular relationship. Remember, Herod has a stirred conscience, but then the yeast just grows and grows and slowly cooks, and he ends up with a violated conscience. And he goes against his own perception to save face with others. A relationship is his downfall. I said this a couple of weeks ago. It's worth saying again. I think I can say this in, in my short experience in pastoral ministry, that it is relationship choices more than anything else that lead to the single most common way people end up far away from Jesus in the end. A relationship choice. I, I'm just exploring a little bit, just dabbling. I don't, I don't intend this to be long-term. It is the single most common reason people end up walking away from Christ. There is real danger, friends, in letting yourself listen to Jesus, but postponing the decision you know you need to make. I'll decide soon. I'll decide tomorrow. Sometimes the yeast grows and grows, and you find yourself caught in a web of your own making. There is almost no way out of it. That's what Jesus is meaning. The, the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Friends, it, it cooks slowly. Do you know what the opposite of the yeast of the Pharisee is? Do you know what the opposite of it is? It's the spirit of thinking that just sitting here in church this evening, clothed and in your right mind, is a miracle of grace. That's the opposite of the Pharisee. Me, Lord, me here, known by you and loved by you, that is astonishing, amazing. It's the spirit of chapter 7, verse 25, what Struan showed us last Sunday. Isn't that such a beautiful story? A woman, a Gentile, a Syrophoenician woman, a woman that the world regards as a dog, throws herself at Jesus' feet. Do you know that in Mark's gospel, she is the first person to understand a parable. It's amazing. Mark has it that it is a woman and a Gentile woman, the first to understand a cryptic saying by the Lord Jesus. After one sentence, she understands who Jesus is and what He's come to do. He has come to feed His people and come to feed the nations of the world. What has she done? Verse 25, she has fallen at His feet. Friends, that is what makes you clean this evening. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else ever makes us clean. Do you see what Jesus is saying to her there? Verse 27, the children have eaten all they want. The children have eaten all they want. The feeding of the 5,000. I've given them 12 basketfuls of bread. 5,000 bellyfuls. 12 baskets. What's the point of the 12? The 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus has come to feed His people. They still don't know who I am, my children. Chapter 8, I've given them seven basketfuls left over. Who does Jesus feed in chapter 8, chapter the feeding of the 4,000? Not Jewish people this time, but Gentile people. And He feeds them with seven basketfuls left over, seven the number of completeness and perfection. Seven, to show you that even Gentiles can be saved completely. I can feed the whole world perfectly, Jesus is saying, and still you don't know who I am. Oh, but look, look how clean your hands are. Look how, how nicely you're dressed for church. Look how often you read your Bible. Look how well you sing, how well behaved your children are, how nicely they pray, and look how hard your hearts are. And now the unclean Gentile comes and she worships me straight away. On a mere crumb, she falls before me and worships me. You know, you know friends, the, the good news about Jesus, 
the good news about the Lord Jesus is the difference between a barrier and a bridge. Do you know that? The Pharisees were skilled barrier makers. The Pharisees took God's law and erected a wall around it so that nobody ever came into contact with anything dirty. They built fences all around God's law to protect themselves and to keep themselves clean, but they forgot along the way that God's number one priority was people, not performance. And Jesus comes as a bridge, not a barrier, a bridge right into human need. And He comes to the outcast and the dirty and the defiled, and He touches them and makes them clean. Friends, I want to ask you, are you erecting barriers around the Bible, barriers around God's law, and are you slowly beginning to drift, slowly drifting from Jesus? Some of us in this room won't be here in five years' time. It's just how it works. Simon Arskett, one of uh, the ministers in our family of churches, he was preaching on a passage like this recently in, uh, in Presbytery, and he said this. He said, isn't it fascinating how people change their minds? It rarely happens overnight. People very rarely wake up one day and take a sudden decisive shift in their thinking. You know, the influence of Herod thinking and Pharisee thinking is gradual, isn't it? It's subtle, it's, it's undetected. There's a new teaching that circulates, a new idea, and people play around with it and toy with it. Toy with it. Let, me, let me just try it for a little bit, they think. Let me play devil's advocate, and gradually and steadily a change takes place. See, friends, just think of your own journey. What did you believe 10 years ago? Think of where you were 10 years ago. What do you believe now? I, I suspect there's been some change. I hope there's been some change. What will you be believing five years from now? You, 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 you're being exposed to yeast every week. What kind of yeast is it, Jesus asks? Doug, Douglas Murray, uh, the gay uh, atheist writer, I think he's an atheist, certainly very sympathetic to Christian people in lots of ways, very clear thinker. Douglas Murray talks about what he calls the Nicky Morgan phenomenon. Do you know the Nicky Morgan phenomenon? She was former education secretary, and she opposed gay marriage in 2013. By 2014, she was for gay marriage, and by 2015, she saw opposition to gay marriage as evidence of extremism. Sometimes, friends, we can be the very last to realize we're being influenced. We're, we're unaware that we're slowly being leavened in the wrong direction. This is why Jesus says, beware, watch out. It, it's subtle. The, the, the vapors are in the air. Maybe, maybe if we had a leaven detector in the room, it would be bleeping. You would hear it bleeping now, the alarm going off. I simply want to say this evening, friends, come back to Christ. Come back to the Lord Jesus and to His gospel of grace and to the kind of people that He welcomes and how He welcomes them. I, I told you at the beginning about Douglas Wilson, uh, the pastor, his words to Christopher Hitchens. I didn't, I didn't give you all of his words. Let me finish with this. Your Christian name, Christopher, means bearer of Christ. Your baptism means the same thing. And the third commandment requires you not to bear or carry that name in vain. Some, as you are doing and have done, revolt against the terms of their discipleship. But it does not mean that the demands of Christ on your life are revoked. Christopher, I do not bring this up in order to upbraid you. I do not know if you departed from the faith because you drifted from it or bolted from it or were chased away by hypocritical Christians. Nevertheless, the kindness of God is revealed to all of us in Jesus. And everybody, whatever their story, must come to terms with this kindness. Listen to this. 
Jesus has established his great but welcoming household, and there is room enough for you. Nothing you have ever said or done will be held against you. Everything will be washed and forgiven. There is simple food, bread and wine on the table. The door is open and we'll leave the light on for you. Amen. Well, let's sing our closing worship. This hymn based on Luke's gospel, chapter 18, uh, the tax collector, the sinner, and the Pharisee in the temple. No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you. Here is the sinner's prayer and song. Dear friends, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen.